Good afternoon and welcome to LocoGen's webinar on industrial fuel switching. Thank you all for joining today. I can still see many people already joining and there's many filtering through at the moment. Um, quick bits for those that have just joined that might not have heard me speak a couple of minutes ago. The webinar today is around 40 minutes. There's going to be 10 to 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. So feel free to ask your questions throughout in the Q&A box. If you can't hear me or you can't see the screen, um, Post, post in the chat function now and we'll try and get help with uh, Derek's on hand to help with that. We will be recording and we are recording right now and it will be available on YouTube and you can check out the LocoGen YouTube channel um, and we will circulate the slides so there's absolutely no need to ask. Um, our contact details are on the screen as well and we're more than happy for you to get in contact should you have any questions. Today's webinar um, is going to be hosted by myself. I'm Philippa Hardy, um, Head of Emerging Technologies at LocoGen, and I'm joined by my colleague David, who you can see as well, hopefully. Um, and today we're going to be talking about industrial fuel switching. Um, so thank you all for joining. Um, we're going to be looking at the drivers for fuel switching. So why are we talking about it? What's the market context? And then David's going to be talking you through some of the technology options. So how to move away from gas and oil and onto low carbon and renewable systems. And then some learnings from some of our real projects. They are anonymized, but we are sharing some um, interesting case studies from different sectors, which should be relevant for all of you. We'll start with a quick introduction to LocoGen. It's just one slide for anyone that hasn't already heard of us. Um, we are a small company based in Edinburgh and we really focus on renewable energy. We're a developer and consultancy and we deliver renewable energy and low carbon projects. Um, we develop, construct and operate a range of projects for our own portfolio, as well as joint venture projects with commercial and community partners. And we also offer a range of other services to help our clients develop their own projects. And that includes technical consultancy services. And that's where me and David sit in the organisation. So anything from technical consenting and implementation services um, to energy services and asset management. Um, we're actively developing across a variety of technologies listed on the slide here. Um, so solar, PV, wind, hydro, renewable heat, storage, and more recently hydrogen, local energy systems and EV infrastructure. And we work with a, a huge array of clients, um, quite a lot of commercial and industrial clients, as well as public sector, um, SMEs and uh, lenders and communities as well. And that's enough about us. Um, if you need any more information, I'm sure you'll get in touch. So let's crack on with the webinar and look at the drivers for industrial fuel switching. Um, most of this stuff, hopefully you're going to know. Um, so it shouldn't come as a surprise, but if it does, again, please get in touch, we can, we can fill you in. Um, but fuel switching really is key for industrial um, sectors. So today the CCC shows that 12% of total UK greenhouse gas emissions from manufacturing and construction sectors, so very industrial sectors, and 90% of these emissions are from fuel combustion. Um, so fuel combustion is clearly you know, a big win if we can change that and switch fuels over from gas and oil and more carbon intensive fuels to low carbon and renewable fuels. This is going to provide a really easy win, if you like, to decarbonize uh, the UK's emissions. And fuel combustion is generally being used for high and low grade heat, drying and separation, space heating and on-site electricity generation. Now, progress has been made. So if you look at the pie chart, that's our final energy consumption in 2019 in industry. So quite a lot of gas, um, a lot of electricity as well, and 10% petroleum products, and then some smaller bits of the others. Um, and we have made progress. So since 2017, oil products have reduced quite a lot, but clearly there's still a long way to go. And these sectors are very hard to decarbonize. Um, fuel switching from oil and gas to hydrogen, electricity and bioenergy really is going to provide a route to reduce emissions from this sector. What's driving, oh, before we go into what's driving this, <laughs> well, let's engage with you guys. Um, it would be great just to learn who is on the, who is listening in today. So it, rather than sectors, we're going to ask via fuel. So what fuels um, is your site operating on for your heating, power, space heating, um, processes, loads, whatever, anything. You can select more than one, and I'm sure you probably will need to select more than one. But today, what uh, yeah, what fuel are you using? Is it representative from the pie chart that we saw a minute ago, 
or are you all already on renewables? Um, it'll be great to find out. So we'll give you 30 seconds to quickly answer our poll um, so we can have a look at who's using what and what kind of perspective you're coming from. Are you already decarbonising? Are you on the journey or are you kind of at the start of it still on oil and gas and, and thinking about what to do next? Um, we would just love to know. It should be, we've got many responses in there. It should give you enough time, I think. Hopefully everyone's responded. Um, if we're about there, let's have a look at the responses. Cool, awesome. Great stuff. So pretty reflective of the slide on the first, um, on the slide previously. So 60% gas, 60% electricity, a good amount of on-site renewables. That's what we love to see, 26%, fantastic. And 5% fuel oil, um, which is expected as well because that's we're used to oil and gas and it is very much part of the, the ecosystem at the moment. Great, awesome, right, let's crack on. So drivers for fuel switching. Um, now, again, all of you hopefully are all aware of these changes. I'm just going to quickly summarise them. Um, and I'm sure you're all being impacted and you're all feeling um, these changes at the moment. But we're looking at drivers um, and these are the ones we're seeing at the moment. So the market is changing rapidly. We're seeing that anyway over the last few years. The momentum is shifting. You know, renewables and low carbon tech is coming to the forefront. Um, and in the last weeks, we are seeing a uh, other drivers that are going to force that more, for example, energy prices. Um, we've all been impacted. <laughs> uh, the gas, gas, coal and electricity prices in recent weeks have been at their highest that they've been at in decades, um, caused by a combination of factors, which again, I'm sure you're all aware of, including consumption plunge due to COVID and then rebound due to a rapid economic recovery, interconnector outages, a cold and long winter, less wind at the moment. Um, and obviously that's had gas and oil prices have a knock on effect to electricity. So all the prices are, are high at the moment. It is possible to protect ourselves against these prices. So there's 26% of you already have on-site renewables. Um, having some or all of your power via on-site renewables protects you, it gives you a bit more price security. Um, but we do think this trend is going to continue um, given some of the reforms coming up. For example, the rebated fuel reform. So from April 2022, so that's next year, rebated fuels such as red diesel, fuel oil, biodiesel and kerosene will no longer receive a discount and instead be taxed at the standard rate. So that's an increase of around 47 pence per litre and that's going to affect most users of rebated fuels. Um, and this is all again meeting climate change targets and air quality targets, so a necessary change. And on top of that, we've had news recently of a green surcharge. Now there is discussions at the UK and EU level to put an end to fossil fuel subsidies and to remove green taxes from electricity and gas. And there's been some news recently around rebalancing and the charges in gas, in electricity to gas. This has already happened to a certain extent with the climate change le uh, levy and the government is hinting that it's gonna happen more. Now domestic customers are pretty protected by a price cap. Industrial customers aren't, um, so we'll feel this more. But it's not all doom and gloom on the tax front. Um, there's a bit of, there's some, there's some, you know, there's a carrot and a stick going on. So uh, between April 2021 and March 2023, um, companies investing in new qualifying equipment and plant machinery, etc., can actually claim a super deduction in tax. So if you're investing in the right equipment, then you can claim tax back. So there's some push and pull going on. In terms of policy, there's a load of policy pushing us in the direction of low carbon tech as well. So Obviously, net zero is a legal obligation by 2050. I'm sure you've all heard of it by this point. Um, and there's interim targets set by the CCC to meet them. Um, and we all need to meet this, uh, companies, customers, people. And it, there's been significant changes. So there's just some stats there from PAS um, Science-Based Target Initiative and the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, kind of three key organisations in this space. Um, and there's a lot of companies making commitments, creating strategies, targets, action plans. So it's a really exciting um, movement that's, that's actually happening now, and um, which is fantastic to see. On top of that, we're seeing the UK government discuss uh, making the uh, decarbonising the electricity system by 2035, which will have a significant shift on how and, and what we use as a fuel source. And we're also seeing future 
strategy policy documents coming out. So most recently, the UK hydrogen strategy, you know, placing hydrogen as an important part of the mix going forward. Um, and we're currently waiting on the heat and building strategy from the UK government, um, but the Scottish government has released theirs. And again, the direction of travel is clear. We're going to, we need to move to low carbon and renewable sources. We're going to have to electrify heat and different processes. So it's really gone past uh, the point of if and when it's, it's happening now and we know what we need to do. Um, so the direction of travel is really couldn't be clearer. Um, so yeah, let's crack on. <laughs> let's not wait. Let's get on with it. Um, in terms of funding, um, obviously we've seen there's been incentives, um, there's been subsidies for renewables, but we're now in an era where actually PV and wind doesn't have to be subsidised, it's subsidy free. Um, the costs have come down, they're quite competitive. In terms of low carbon technology projects and renewable projects, um, they don't all need to be funded. They don't all need incentives to work, actually. You know, we've seen PV and wind and renewables now no longer need subsidies. And there are examples where projects work, feel like they're financially feasible. You know, if you're in a highly constrained area, if there's significant reinforcement costs, if there just aren't any other options um, or where other factors are valued that wouldn't otherwise be valued, such as um, resilience and CSR and net zero. Um, and there's a whole range of technologies. So David's going to talk about that in a minute. So some are more innovative and new and more expensive. Others are, have been around for quite a long time now and have, the prices are coming down. Um, for those technologies that are newer, um, there is grant funding available. It's very competitive. It's time bound. It's technology bound. It's industry bound. So there's lots of requirements around it. And to reiterate, it is competitive. So it's not a given. But there's a few we've just listed there. If you're not already aware of, these are grant fundings to help um, bring about low carbon technologies into specific industries. And these are all relevant to industrial sectors. Um, we monitor this for our clients. So we work with commercial and industrial clients to help them realise projects. Um, again, David will talk about that in a minute. So we have a good handle on what funding is coming out and when. Um, so, yeah, if you need any more information on that, feel free to get in touch. And last poll, before we crack on into telling you more about the technology, um, it would be great to hear from you on how far progress you are in your net zero targets and action plans. Um, so if we launch that poll, um, would you describe your net zero progress as top notch, super awesome? So you've already made huge changes. You know, you've transferred your fuel completely. You've already done the fuel switching. You should be a guest speaker on this webinar to tell us what you've done. You know, you're a real superhero. Click number one. Um, you've nailed it, you've got your ta target set, you've sorted out your strategy and your action plan is done. And now it's kind of like, okay, we need to start making those steps. So you're really progressing very well with um, having that target and strategy in place. Or are you working on it right now? I think most companies are. Um, you're creating your targets and strategies and action plans, or you're figuring out the different definitions in the space, which is can be quite complicated as well. Um, and yeah, maybe you're doing it right now. <laughs> Um, or you're thinking about it. So you've heard about it. You've been to some net zero webinars. You haven't got an action plan in place yet, but you know you need to and there's movement internally. Um, and then there's a fifth option and hopefully no one will take that option. But, you know, some companies haven't moved as quickly as others um, as seen by the number of people that have signed up to SBTI and other initiatives out there. So it wouldn't have been unheard of if we have plenty of people taking number five as well. Hopefully that's enough preamble from me to have given you enough time to tick a box. Um, it was only one choice, so it wouldn't have been that hard. Can we have a look at the answers, please, Derek? Awesome. Yes, we have 11%, 22% of superheroes and nailed it targets. That's really good to see. A majority, as we thought, working on it. Yeah, that's kind of where we thought it would be. And uh, yeah, a few thinking about it and don't want to tick this box, but appreciate your honesty. Um, okay, interesting. Cool, thank you very much. So without further ado, let's pass you over to David to talk more about the alternative technology options. Grant, thank you very much, Pip. Um, so um, there are, as Pip's alluded to, there are a number of different mechanisms that we can look at to switch the existing fuel that you're using uh, or the source of the fuel um, to, to, to meet those net zero or, or, or low carbon ambitions. And we've sort of lumped them together into three broad categories. Um, hydrogen is, is something that's talked about a great deal at the moment. Hydrogen is, is, is produced predominantly from the electrification of, of water. 
Um, we can, once you've produced the hydrogen, we can use that in a number of different ways, either by burning it directly um, or by using it to, to, to store and create energy. The second option is electricity, either the production of renewable electricity through on-site generation or the use of that electricity to offset existing heat consumption through some form of heat pumps or, or the more innovative uh, sort of uh, electrical storage systems that can be utilized um, uh, to, to use that electricity at higher, more industrial process heat temperatures. Or we have our bioenergy options, ranging from the sort of more traditional burning wood chip and, and, and pellets to generate heat through to more innovative biofuels, or even uh, using waste materials to, to make anaerobic digestion to produce a, a synthetic biogas. So we can, a lot of these options you'll have heard of, some of them, some of which you, you, you may not. So we thought we'd take the opportunity just to, to drill down a little into, into three of them. Um, so we, we mentioned hydrogen. The, there's a lot of talk about hydrogen and how we make that fit um, into the, the, the UK strategy, where we produce it from and, and how we use it. Um, hydrogen has the potential to, to be used in a lot of combustion appliances um, to offset the existing oil or, or gas consumption in a way that is, is fairly comparable to, uh, to the way you burn fuel at the minute, um, using the cell, same sort of shell and tube boilers um, to, to raise steam or, or to make process hot water. Um, so it, it can require reasonably lim limited modifications, which is good for a lot of process applications. The downside with, with hydrogen or some of the limitations are to do with the fact that it's still an emerging market. There are not large numbers of, uh, of sort of commercial hydrogen producers. So a lot of the hydrogen that, that's being made is being made on site specifically for the application that's being used. And if you're doing that, you've got to have some way of storing the hydrogen. Hydrogen is quite a, quite a light gas and requires either quite a bit of compression or, or large volumes of storage. Um, and you've got to have the electricity and the water to, to make that happen. So it is, it is more on the innovative, still on the, the developmental side of some of these technologies. Or well, there are products that are coming through the market, a lot of boiler manufacturers that are ready and, and set up to deliver hydrogen boiler technologies. He says, looking hopefully for the slide to keep going. Um, the, the, the second is around uh, electrical thermal batteries. These on the face of it are relatively simple systems. They are using uh, resistive electric heaters to store electricity as heat, but on an industrial scale. These, uh, these can run up to uh, six, 600, 650 degrees centigrade. Um, have very long storage periods with, with, with relatively low losses, which means that we can use off-peak or, or, uh, or locally generated electricity at times of surplus to store that energy to then be extracted out to run process heat loads. Um, so these are particularly effective where we have um, uh, either grid flexibility or where matched with sites that have uh, uh, things like steam process demands. Um, so, and they have very fast response rates. So we can actually get quite effective electrification replacement for steam um, at a much larger scale than the sort of traditional small um, electric steam generators. The downside, the, although the, the, the processes that fit within them are fairly well established, it's a systems engineering approach that we need to uh, develop in terms of getting these systems well established. Um, there are a few manufacturers, but they're, but they're quite small. So the supply chain is a little limited. Um, and the investment cost is, is quite high at this moment, although that is coming down. And then heat pumps. Um, again, I'm sure most people on the call will be, uh, be aware of, uh, of heat pumps. One of the, the limitations for, for heat pump technologies for a long time has been their ability to go to increasing temperatures, but limited to 50, 60, 65 degrees. Um, so manufacturers have been working uh, uh, quite a lot to, to develop different uh, organic materials that can be used for the heat pump to, to improve and, and efficiencies that they can improve on the heat pump cycle so that they can run those at higher temperatures. Um, and in the last few years, we've had manufacturers come forward with technologies that can run at 90, 
110, 120 uh, degree systems. Um, uh, ones, and they have ones that, that are even uh, in development that will run even higher. This means that we're starting to get into the realms of being able to deliver at the very least low pressure steam um, systems and sort of medium temperature hot water for, for process loads. Um, because of the way the heat pumps operate, it does mean that they, they, they can benefit from integration with heat recovery, but also there's a lot of modifications that sometimes have to be made to the distribution systems and the operation of those systems to make them work and fit with the way the heat pumps like to do. Heat pumps like a continuous operation, but don't like to cycle yeah, rapidly. Um, and those temperature limitations mean that there are, there are limits to, to where we can currently utilize them. And of course, you're going to need a, a larger electricity supply to, to, to make heat pumps run because we're using it to offset uh, the fuel source, the, the, the sort of liquid and gas fuel sources. With each of these technologies, we are we're approaching these much more at a, a systems level approach um, to make with each of those, we're alluded to the fact that that it in itself is, is very unlikely to be a direct replacement for the systems you currently use. There's a wider level approach that has to be taken to how the operation of some of these processes, how the integration with the on-site systems and usages are going to have to be modified to make these systems work at their most effective. So a lot of the work that we do is working with clients to take that step back and understand their systems and their processes and to how we can adapt the technologies that are there to fit in with their demands, not just their current, but also their future development demands and their, their system replacements, their, their on-site refurbishment works, so that you can plan out a system of works that, that fits, because these are longer term decisions that we're, that we're looking at. So this is just an overview of some of the, the sort of key considerations that we are taking on board when we are starting to look at how we, which, the, which combination of technologies we're looking at and how they fit with sort of each client's requirements. So those are the kind of the, the, the theories, just to give you a, a little bit of an overview of some of the, uh, the, the projects that we've been, uh, that we've been looking at. Um, so the, the first is an example of a, of a manufacturing site where they have, they have set uh, internally quite, um, quite impressive uh, carbon trajectory targets. So what they wanted was they wanted to, to move to, to, to net zero as quickly as possible. Um, they wanted to see what was possible that they could invest um, in terms of making that transition as quick as they possibly could. Um, so we, we went through a series of exercises. We got into, into a huge amount of depth about how their processes work and their integrations what options for resources they had on site and, and, and in the, the local area so we could bring in sort of larger off-site renewable generation but connected by private wire into the site, to come up with a, a range of technology solutions that would allow, enable them to meet that, that really quite impressive carbon trajectory. And we, we modeled dozens of different options to come up with the, the most sort of cost-effective balance of, of doing that. And you needed multiple systems and to, to have a replacement cycle for that usage to make it balance. Um, but you can see from the graph on the right, their, their growth plan is, is, quite, is quite reasonable over the next sort of you know, 20, 30 years, but we were able to, to actually reduce the carbon emissions um, uh, rapidly um, and reach it to the point where by the generation of the on-site electricity actually make it in a lot of the long term a very cost-effective approach. Second is a, is a food, food manufacturing site, um, a, a dairy. So they have a, a different set of considerations, lots of uh, high energy use, lower temperatures, but they've got the combination of, of both heating and cooling and, uh, and, and waste that's produced. So, but they wanted to move from, from, from oil. So uh, again, through a, through a series of options appraisals, looking at different technologies that are available, how that would fit with their systems. Um, that ended up being a, an AD solution that, that, that was taken forward. One of the interesting things about working with that particular client, and, and this may ring true with a number of you, is that although they had a number of meters on site and they knew quite a bit about where their energy was going, to get to the level of detail to work out how the, the specific systems would integrate, we actually had to go back in and work with them to do a lot more detail, understanding how that energy worked on a regular basis. 
so that they could understand where that system would be best optimized because the first pass assessment and what they what they end up going with were quite different um and we because we we're able to help fine tune that to make it really effective we we're also able to uh, to support the client in, in obtaining significant grant funding through through one of the mechanisms to, to make the system cost effective um the third is a, a distillery example um so again uh, uh currently currently using uh fuel oil currently very uh, reasonably expensive in the next year going to be um, fantastically expensive for them to, to to operate their processes um so and they were uh, again with a with a very sort of strict um quite rapid decarbonization plan that they wanted to put in place and willing to to go for um some of the more innovative technology solutions so with them we worked on a green hydrogen solution so this was the combination of on-site generation using both pv and wind and to produce hydrogen to replace the bulk of their on-site fuel oil usage um so quite a quite an innovative uh technology approach that we wanted to go for and again we were able to to, to work with them and identify a particular Bayes uh, uh, government funded um, grant mechanism that's actually being able to fund uh, a large part of the capital works uh, of this project to enable them to push this through as an innovation scheme. Um, and, and that's currently going into planning now. So it's a, a, live, a live project that will get built out over the next 18 months. Um, the fourth is a um, is an example of a, a distillery and hotel complex where we were working with them to develop a, um, a, a ground source heat pump system utilizing the, 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 the groundwater uh, in and around the, uh, the river system. So we're actually using uh, what is basically river water brought up through the ground and re-injected into the river. Um, it was a, a quite technically a complex project to, to put in place. Um, but again, we were, uh, by working with them, understanding their criteria and their requirements, able to act, help them access a number of different grants, in fact, a series of overlapping grants um, to, to get the scheme constructed. And this is actually being built uh, at this moment in time. So that goes live uh, uh, just after Christmas. Um, and the last is, is, an, op is an example of, of where a client had uh, an industrial process that they wanted to, to develop. Um, they had a site in mind. Um, they were looking at quite a quite an innovative heat pump solution, so a high temperature heat pump system. Um, but in understanding their their business model, what they wanted to do on that site was also develop out a number of holiday cottages, connect to the local area. So we we were able to help them expand out and understand the, the options for increasing the viability of the the scheme by including not just their, their existing plans, but how it could integrate over a period of time into to other local uses that they had in mind, which meant that they could push forward some of the commercial plans they had in place. Um, it also came with the option to, to, to access certain grant, um, grant funding related to district heating networks. Um, so it, it allowed for you know, taking that step back, meant that we could think about this, this system in, in, a, in a wider sense um, and make it decarbonize a, a wider part of their sort of long-term development strategy okay cool. thank you david so i'm just gonna summarize a few of the things that we've been talking about today before we go into our q a um hopefully the case studies that david's talked through has given some food for thought um they're summarized here on this slide, it works. <laughs> uh, summarised here in the graph in terms of the pound per ton of CO2 equivalents saved across the five projects David's just discussed. Um, I guess just to, to summarise um, from my side, the, the kind of projects we've David's just been discussing are, are big, long-term strategic projects. They are capital intensive. Some are using newer, more innovative technologies, um, which obviously have a different risk profile, obviously more expensive because they're not a, you know, a very readily available solution. They're very new to market, maybe a slightly earlier TRL level than uh, technology readiness level than others. Um, others that he's discussed were using multiple established technologies to create energy systems. And you know, whilst they're established technologies, multiple systems and an energy system um, is more capital intensive as well. However, 
as David's discussed, it can create bigger benefits long term. Um, I think in terms of decarbonising sites, we've seen that most of the low hanging fruit changes the companies can make, they have already. So over the last decade or so, um, we've spent a lot of time on energy efficiency, changing all those lights, um, but PV on roof that's not integrated, uh, making use of the feed and tariffs and other projects um, with other technologies and with small paybacks, you know, something around a couple of years. So easy wins. And that's been fantastic. But I think now it's time to look at it in a different way and really scale up our ambition. Um, so reaching net zero goals will require integrated energy systems across sites or maybe wider areas, maybe local energy systems. For example, renewables, heat and power considered holistically and optimised. Um, it's going to need long term strategy and organisational buy in um, and long term planning as well um, and much more longer term investments and and be and expect a longer term payback. You know, this isn't the sort of stuff that's going to pay back in a couple of years. It has to be a strategy and a, and a long term um, investment mindset to these projects to make them to make them happen. And as David's discussed, there's a lot of technologies already out there, some more innovative than others, a lot readily available commercially. Um, so what are we waiting for? <laughs> it's time to act now. Um, these projects can take you know, a wee while to do the feasibility study and to get through planning and, and actually install. So we need to start acting now so that these projects actually happen. Um, at the start of the webinar, I gave some drivers. I think all of these drivers are only going to continue to increase. They're going to continue to push the renewable and low carbon agenda. Um, and as an example, in the last in the last webinar we did a couple of months ago, we actually discussed the how the oil and gas prices are eventually going to reach parity with electricity prices by 2040. And you know, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen gas prices and gas and oil prices really increase. So we're seeing these changes already happening. We're not going to be waiting until 2040, 2050. Um, I think a lot is going to change between now and 2025, 20, 2030. Um, there isn't a silver bullet. There isn't ever a silver bullet in terms of switching technology. David's discussed loads of options. There's loads more that we haven't discussed. Um, there's, and it's going to be bespoke to your site. Different sites that have been set up in different ways and have different demands. Um, so they all need to be looked at individually. Um, and all technologies will have their own benefits and considerations. So it's all it's about considering which is going to be best suited, which matches your risk profile for investment, which matches um, the needs of the site and the future trajectory of, of your operations and, and many other considerations. Um, financial feasibility, we mentioned it can be difficult for new tech. Not always. There are exceptions to the rule. Um, but yeah, often low carbon technologies, they're not as widely used. So the capex is higher. And the paybacks are higher. They're not impossible, they're just higher. Um, so it's about changing our mindsets on what is an acceptable payback. Um, and with energy prices rising, as I mentioned, running costs of new technology can actually be lower. So even though the capital might be higher, the running cost benefits and might outweigh that capital investment. Um, adopting low carbon technology today is a long term strategic choice, as we've both said. Um, and early adopters, if you're in the right place at the right time, and maybe you've already had that first pass assessment of your site and you know what you need to do and you've made your plan, you know, you could be in a position where you could apply for grant funding that just so happens to be in the right time at the right place. I mentioned earlier that the grants, you know, they are very competitive, they're very specific and they're very time bound. So it's about making action early, making your plans early, thinking about what you need to do. And then when the funding is in the right place and you're there and ready, then you can take advantage of it to realize your net zero plans. Um, so that's some of the key takeaways. Um, for everyone online today, um, the same as in our last webinar, we are very happy that you've come to our webinar. We'd love to um, give you half an hour of our time for free, informal no obligation <laughs> just a chat and um, so if you do want to speak with either myself or David or one of our um, expert engineers about your site about net zero plans about techno-economic feasibility there should be a poll coming up now that you can select um, if you want to talk to any of these things um, what an options appraisal is what you could do 
a general chat about renewables and low carbon technologies. We are all pretty enthusiastic about this stuff, hopefully as you've gleaned from this webinar. So we like to just have informal chats with people and understand um, your issues. It, it helps us as well. Um, so it's a mutual benefit for us to have these calls. It's not always one sided or anything else. Maybe there's other stuff you'd like to talk about as long as it's to do with energy. That's totally fine. Um, so yeah, please take advantage of this offer um, and let us know if we haven't already got your contact details, post them um, through to us and we can get in touch and you've got our email address as well. So you can always just contact us directly. Um, but yeah, feel free to mark in the box now um, if you'd like to speak to us again. And that's that's just bang on time as well. Um, so we've got a good 10 minutes really for any questions. We've got a few questions come through. Um, now is your time to ask us more questions. Um, we won't spend too long on this um, because I'm sure you've all got other meetings to get to. Um, but we will start with uh, what we've got already. Let me just have a look. So we had a couple of questions on, we had two on policy actually, which I think I'll just take first. So there was someone asking about the green surcharge and has it, has it actually happened yet? So the, no, I think it's a short answer. It is, it's news articles at the moment and um, indications in the market that uh, the taxes on gas and electricity will change. Um, we're monitoring it to see when it does change because obviously that's going to impact any sort of financial feasibility we do for any of our clients. Um, so that's a very quick short answer for that one. Um, there's another one on net zero and this is it's a good question and it's always um, it always comes up actually when you talk about net zero how much is it real action versus reducing impact and offsetting um, and I think from our perspective as a company it's about making real action um, there's only so much offsetting you can do the technological solutions are there okay they're more expensive but they're there and we need to make real action rather than offset um, if, if we all off offset we're going to end up in a pickle in another decade's time so yeah we need real action and i think that's a key difference between some of the initiatives out there so the the sbti the science-based targets initiative is all about um uh, making net zero targets aligned with climate science and that's all about reduce real reduction rather than offsetting um happy to talk about that more if anyone wants to talk about that more but I right, will leave it there for now um a couple of other questions we've got how realistic yeah, is it to electrify a manufacturing site I'm going to pass that one over to David <laughs> um it is uh, it, it is realistic to be able to, manu uh, to 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 transform a uh, manufacturing site to an all electric solution but as I'm sure most of you will be aware, there are multiple different processes and systems that are in place. So there are going to be a number of different uh, technology approaches that are going to need to be thought through and, and combined. Um, it, it's very common to have a mix of, of motors, heating, cooling, um, uh, storage, uh, a bunch of other sort of things we need to talk about this, the electrification of vehicles, all these different technology approaches that need to be considered so that we can think about what the balances of that are. What we're trying to do is to not make uh, any um, uh, anything that's going to, to, to cause massive grid upgrade requirements. Um, so, so it has to be thought about carefully. Um, so although possible, it adds a, a degree of strategic um, uh, thinking that's required. Cool, thanks. Um, and we had a question in the chat around our I know we've answered it, but I don't think the people in the audience can see. So we had a question on um, how much expertise and knowledge and projects we've been involved in, in on the hydrogen side, um, which David's already answered. Um, but yeah, we, we've done currently engaged in numerous projects. I had, was it six, six live? And then we've had previous involvement in some other projects as well. Um, and yeah, ranging from anything from initial feasibility, first pass assessment, very light touch, um, all the way through to system development and installation as well. Anything you want to add to that? Oh, that's good. Okay, cool. And we might have an uh, uh, interesting announcement about hydrogen soon, but we, we can't announce that yet. So you'll have to wait till the next webinar that might be on hydrogen uh, to find out to find out more. There's a, there's a hook. Um, 
the, the, there's, there's a question around the, the, the sort of water process for, for, for hydrogen, um, around how much water is created. So uh, the, the combustion of hydrogen produces the same amount of water as was electrolyzed to make the hydrogen in the first place. So I think, I think the question is, is it a virtuous circle? That, yes, but, but it does take more energy to create the hydrogen than the energy you get back from, from, from burning it. So, so it is a, hydrogen is, is, a, is an energy transfer mechanism more than anything. It's, it's to use electricity um, that can be displaced from, from, from one site, converted into hydrogen, and then used at a different time or different location um, in a different way. So, so the, the the water side of it is cyclical. The the energy side there is there is a loss that needs to be considered. Yeah, I think that's it's power to X, isn't it? There's, I mean, these discussions are quite live in the industry at the moment. Like, why, where should hydrogen be used, and what for? And I think there's general agreement that you know it's for not everything needs to be hydrogen. Um, uh, it's for specific applications that are hard to decarbonize or you know quite niche um, for example if you're off grid somewhere in the middle of nowhere and you happen to be right next door to a, a big site and yeah and your energy is curtailed and that's a perfect application or you know these energy systems that you can create in rural communities um and hard to decarbonize big heavy transport but yeah it's again we're in agreement with the the rest of the I think well, all the all energy discussions that were just last week, and the more discussions this week. Um, we've got another question come through. Um, so look, how are Locogen dealing with the impact of wastewater production from green hydrogen generation? You look at me. Um... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah. uh, it's. Uh, the, the the water that's produced from from hydrogen processes is not is not uh, a contaminated waste in the way that, that that we have to deal with 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 a number of other um, sort of systems that that, that we deal with. Um, so so broadly, any excess that uh, water that's that's being produced is usually going to to drain. Um, I'm not aware of any systems where where there's there's sort of a a contamination issue. Um, that's come about from from the production of water from from hydrogen. You do have to have a mechanism for for, for dealing with that, of course. Um, but it, it's not something we've seen as a significant constraint. Um, awesome. Any more questions coming through? Um, there's another question on the decarbonisation of the grid. Um, if the grid is decarbonising. Do we need renewables? I'm assuming that's on site. So, do we need on site renewables? Right. Uh, another really good question. <laughs> so, the um, it's true that the um, that that a lot of the work that we as a country are doing a lot of work to 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 uh, to to install renewable energy systems at a utility scale that is producing that is meaning that our grid electricity is getting greener. Um, which is which is really great for, for the country as a whole, and it means that the electricity that you buy, if you are not in a position to uh, to generate renewable energy on site, um, is getting greener. Which makes that means all of the, the electrification options that we're putting in place, the, the heat pumps and the electric vehicles, and all those other things are are greening your your installations um, by default. The the downside of, of of this is that the the price of electricity is the highest pretty much of, of any fuel that you, that you can buy. So the advantage of, of on-site renewables is, is twofold. One, it provides that initial sort of a carbon benefit for the next few years. It allows you to, to push towards your net zero targets much quicker because you've got that initial offset of, of the carbon that is still contained within grid electricity. But going forward, what it's producing you is that is that low cost electricity production. It's giving you that, that certainty of supply or relative certainty of supply, but at least your localized production for a proportion of your electricity, meaning that you can more cost effectively electrify your systems on site um, in a way that's more challenging if you don't have on site generation. Mm. It's, it's not fixed, it's not totally, it doesn't mean that you have to do it, but where you can, there is a strong both 
environmental and financial benefit, um, uh, which which increases, which only increases as grid electricity becomes more expensive. Yeah, I think really resilience, resilience, and protecting your your costs. Um, if you can do it, and if there's if it works, um, when you're on site, then it does definitely does make sense. Um, another question coming through on green gas. Do you see purchasing of green gas playing a part in the path to net zero? Um, I don't know the distinction between purchasing or using. Um, I'm assuming that's not that's purchasing green gas to use on site rather than as an offset. That's how I've interpreted the question. Yeah, yeah. There, there's sort of two two ways you can do this. There are there are manufacturers. So if you're if you're if you're the user of an LPG system, for example, there are manufacturers of, of, of gas that will try and that will that are moving towards being able to sell you greener gas that you can have imported and delivered to your site. The alternative to that is the, the production of gas through anaerobic digestion, for example, that's fed into the national grid to in the same way as we blend uh, sort of petrol and diesel, we're sort of blending our our mains gas. Um, and it, there's also it, hydrogen, <laughs> green yeah. gas. Hydrogen is a green gas as well if you're using it directly, um, or other so, bio. Yeah, I would say that it all it all helps, but but whether it's the most effective use of that 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 green gas, I think it, it, it's evolving. The fact that those that infrastructure is in place that allows us to produce the the green gas and and to decarbonize, I, I would say very much in the same way as blending blending transport fuel. Um, it, it, it's 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 a good short term measure, but it's not going to be the the long term fix we require. Oh, and we've got another one coming through off the back of that. Um, do you think the production of green hydrogen will result in the development of a green oxygen market? Oh, I like this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's something we're looking into at the moment with our project. So yeah, for those that don't know anything about hydrogen, um, probably you do if you're already on this webinar, but yeah, you produce in the production of hydrogen, green hydrogen, you're also producing oxygen um, and it's a, it's a byproduct. So yeah, if you can catch that and sell it and it's green hydrogen, I, I kind of see that as a, I mean, it's great marketing for anyone that sells an oxygen product to start with because it's been created and it's clean, it's been created through renewable energy. Um, and it's a, it's a way that the providers of oxygen can clean what they're producing as well. So I think absolutely the, there's, that's going to contribute to the market. I think there's already evidence that it is. Anything to add to that, David? I, like all these things, it, it, it benefits from scale. That, yeah. That's oh, yeah. sort of the, 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 main, the main limitation with this. So we, we looked at either small scale ox oxygen production for, for local site usage where we're dealing with um, academic uh, inst institutions um, uh, where they have some sort of, where they have some oxygen demands on site. Um, so they're, they're quite interested in, 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 in using that. We've also looked at uh, hydroxy combustion, so using both the hydrogen and the oxygen direct from the system and combustion on site, which, which you can use for, for quite high temperature combustion, which is quite cool. Um, but, but yeah, we're probably a little way off a, off a sort of large scale green oxygen thing but, but we need yeah. to get a hydrogen green hydrogen market going <laughs> first but yeah it's probably by, as a byproduct but again and scale in terms of the scale of the plants so mm. if you're the plant that's producing green hydrogen needs to be on big enough scale to be able to capture the oxygen as well um like in a financial feasibility sort of way cool um Loads of questions. Great. Thanks all for your questions. Um, any final questions before we wrap up? Keen to wrap this up to give you plenty of time to go and get a cup of tea before you go into your four o'clocks. Um, but happy to answer any final questions that you have. Um, something we discussed earlier, David, maybe just to end on is um, obviously we've talked today about there's more mature technologies in terms of low carbon tech. and There's more innovative ones um, and the availability of them we were discussing in terms of, you know, Innovative tech, they're here now. They, they are commercially available. Some are at earlier technology readiness levels, some are more mature, um, but it's all about that risk appetite and, and the application that's being used for. I wonder if you want to comment on that any further. Yeah, I think the, the projects where we were talking about where they've been able to access more significant levels of, of grant funding had been because they the, the, those organisations were were willing to take a, a large, larger risk appetite to be able to, to do something that bit more innovative. And I think that that will that will sort of affect 
the type of grant money that is available uh, and how successful you might like to be. So, uh, so you know, we have clients with, with, with entirely different views on this and, and it's just understanding what, what that is um, because, yeah, we, that, the, that sort of really innovative, you know, cutting edge approach is, is definitely not for everybody and understandably so. It, it's being realistic about, about what the risks are compared to, to what the investment choices that, that you want to make are. Um, so, so yeah, it's, uh, but there are definitely quite clever and innovative approaches out there, which can get more investment. Um, if you're willing to, 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 to take that, that slightly higher risk. Cool. I think that's probably quite a nice summary <laughs> to end on. Actually, we think we've answered all our questions as well. And that gives everyone 10 minutes to get to the next meeting, but Thank you very much, everyone, for joining today. Um, we've got you all until the end as well, which has been fantastic. So hopefully you've enjoyed um, some of the content we've gone through. Hopefully it's been interesting and useful for you as well. We try to make sure everything we're talking about is relevant and useful. That's what we want to get across with our webinars. So please feel free to give us feedback. Um, it's only our second webinar ever um, as a company. So we're taking on feedback as well. And we hope that our future webinars are equally as useful and um, good for you guys. But yes, thank you very much for attending and for all the questions. We'll be in touch if you want us to be in touch. Otherwise, feel free to get in touch with us and look forward to having you on one of our webinars in the future. Thank you.